Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Twitter owner Elon Musk announced that he'll reveal more details about Twitter's suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story this evening. Musk kicked Kanye West off Twitter last night and the tech billionaire recently displayed an animal using a computer through a microchip plant. What he said about chips and humans. In Arizona, a state judge has ruled that Cochise County must certify its election. The county complied, but a Republican member of the board wouldn't apologize for delaying the process. Alex Jones files for bankruptcy. The host of InfoWars was ordered to pay $1.5 billion in the Sandy Hook defamation trial. As tensions remain high with China, the United States military is set to release its newest stealth bomber. It will be able to operate with or without a crew on board. And California is thinking about reparations for African Americans who are descendants of slavery. It has a half a trillion dollar price tag while the state faces a looming deficit. Twitter owner Elon Musk announced this afternoon that he'll reveal more details about Twitter's suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story. Here's what he tweeted. What really happened with the Hunter Biden story suppression by Twitter will be published on Twitter at 5 p.m. ET, followed by This Will Be Awesome and will include live Q&A. When the drop didn't happen at the designated time, Musk wrote that the reveal was delayed due to fact-checking. Before taking over the company, Musk had previously condemned Twitter's censorship of the New York Post's Hunter laptop story, calling the move incredibly inappropriate. As of the start of this show, Musk has not posted further details about the laptop. We'll keep you updated on this developing story. And Musk suspended Kanye West from Twitter yesterday. Musk says the rapper has gone too far. Meanwhile, a day earlier, Musk held an event where he showed a monkey allegedly operating a computer through a chip implanted in the animal's brain. Here's the story. Elon Musk suspended Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, from Twitter just a few days after he reinstated the rapper and fashion designer. On Thursday, Alex Jones Infowars posted a podcast in which Ye praised inventions allegedly coming from Adolf Hitler. Invented highways, invented the very microphone that I use as a musician. You can't say out loud that this person ever did anything good, and I'm done with that. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. Ye reportedly also said that the Holocaust didn't happen. Later that day, he posted this picture on Twitter, showing the combination of a swastika and the Star of David. Elon Musk reportedly told Ye that he had gone too far. His account is now suspended. President Biden on Friday responded to Ye's remarks, saying the Holocaust happened. Hitler was a demonic figure. Before getting suspended from Twitter, Ye reportedly showed support for the fashion brand Balenciaga, which recently was under fire for including child pornography messages in their ads. The rapper was also in the process of acquiring Parler, a social media company that promotes itself as a free speech platform. However, on Thursday, the company tweeted that the company has mutually agreed with Ye to terminate the intent of sale of Parler. And over at Neuralink, one of Musk's other companies, the tech billionaire hosted an event on Wednesday showcasing a monkey allegedly controlling a computer through a chip implanted in the animal's brain. The company live-streamed the event. This is telepathic typing. So to be clear, this is... The, the, he's not actually using a keyboard. He's moving a, a, the cursor with his mind. On the same day, Musk reportedly said that the company aims to begin implanting its neural devices in humans within the next six months, pending regulatory approval. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. A defiant Arizona county certified its election on Thursday after a judge ruled state law required the approval. Meanwhile, former President Obama takes jabs at Georgia's Republican Senate candidate Herschel Walker. NTD's Arlene Richards has the updates. To accept the election results, 
certified and submitted by the Cochise County Elections Department as the official canvas for the general election held on November 8, 2022. After a state judge ruled against the Cochise County Board of Supervisors on Thursday for failing to certify their election results, the board held an emergency meeting. Two of the three board members then voted to certify the results. Peggy Judd and Tom Crosby, the two Republican members, had previously refused to certify, citing voting machine problems. Arizona law requires all counties to certify their election results within 20 days of the election date. Judge Casey McKinley said Judd and Crosby's actions were unlawful. After voting to certify the election, Republican Peggy Judd applauded the work the board had done, but commented on the election. We have an obligation to see that our elections are, are fair and good and that judgments are made um, to keep the process rolling. I can't say enough about the, how important this effort is that we made, and I am not ashamed of anything I did. Judd added that people have lost faith in elections and she wanted people's votes to be heard. Secretary of State Katie Hobbs said in a statement that the court decision was a win for Arizona's democracy and ensures that all Arizonans will have their votes counted. Hobbs will certify the state election on Monday. As some states are certifying elections, others are conducting runoff elections. In Georgia, former President Barack Obama on Thursday joined Senate incumbent Raphael Warnock for a final rally before the runoff election. After warming up the crowd, Obama sharply criticized Republican challenger Herschel Walker. Fox News reports he said the former professional football star lacked the confidence or the character, the track record of service, that would justify him representing Georgia in the United States Senate right now. The Democratic Party has already won the majority in the Senate, but Obama urged the crowd not to give up and explained how important one more Democratic vote is for the Senate. An extra senator gives Democrats more breathing room on important bills. It prevents one person from holding up everything. The Georgia Senate runoff election is on December 6th. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. InfoWars host Alex Jones has filed for bankruptcy. This is after his defamation trial on the Sandy Hook shooting. During the trial in October, Jones was ordered to pay $1.5 billion to families of the shooting victims. Today, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in a federal court in Houston, Texas. He cited the damages he was ordered to pay. His filing lists $1 billion to $10 billion in liabilities and $1 million to $10 million in assets. Jones acknowledged the filing on his InfoWars broadcast. He asked viewers to shop on his website to help keep the show on air. His personal filing today comes after his parent company, Free Speech Systems, filed for bankruptcy in July. And President Biden today signed legislation to avert a rail strike. He warned of a recession if the walkout happens. And TD's Iris Tao has more. A national rail strike is planned in just a few days. To block it, President Biden signed a bill on Friday forcing rail unions to accept a deal. Without freight rail, many of the U.S. industries would literally shut down. And thanks to the bill Congress passed and one I'm about to sign, we've spared the country that catastrophe. Both the House and the Senate passed a bill this week to impose a labor settlement on rail workers. And Biden acknowledged today that the current settlement did not include pay sick days, which many workers were insisting on. But he said he would keep fighting for it, not only for rail workers. But for every worker in America. I've supported paid sick leave for a long time. I'm going to continue that fight till we succeed. And Biden also touches on the economy, particularly over a November jobs report released this morning. Today, we've learned that the economy added 263,000 jobs in November. Wages for working families, in fact, over the last couple months have gone up. According to the Labor Department, U.S. employers added more jobs than forecast, and wages surged by the most in nearly a year. But it also points to enduring inflation pressures that could encourage the Federal Reserve to keep hiking its rates. The next hike could come at the Fed's next meeting in just two weeks. Reporting from the White House, Iris Howe, NTD News. 
As tensions between the United States and China remain high, the U.S. is set to unveil its latest piece of military equipment tonight. It's the B-21 Raider, a new high-tech stealth bomber designed to launch nuclear weapons even without a crew on board. And TD's Jason Perry has the details. At a time when the United States faces challenges from China and an acute threat from Russia, it's essential that the DOD has the authorities needed to defend the nation, deter our adversaries, and support a lethal, resilient, and healthy joint force. Earlier this week, the Pentagon released a report showing that China was on pace to have over 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. And just a few days later, the United States Air Force is debuting its newest aircraft to the public, the B-21 Raider. It's a high-tech stealth bomber capable of firing conventional weapons and nuclear weapons. Northrop Grumman assembled a team of over 8,000 people and worked over seven years to produce America's newest stealth bomber. Here's Northrop Grumman CEO on CNBC. Well, the B-21 Raider is a long-range strike aircraft, and what that means is it has the range to go anywhere in the world and heart, uh, keep a target at risk. The aircraft is designed to operate with or without a crew on board, and it will use some of the latest technology and weapons that will be incorporated through software upgrades and built-in hardware. It also is a platform, though, that is low observable, and that means it can enter enemy airspace and not be detected. Due to it being coated with advanced materials and new ways to control electronic emissions, the bomber is able to trick enemy radars and disguise itself as another object in the sky. Each of the aircrafts costs $692 million, and the Air Force plans to purchase 100 of them. Currently, there are six B-21 Raiders in the final stages of assembly at Northrop Grumman's plant in Palmdale, California. Jason Perry, NCD News. You can watch the unveiling live at 8 p.m. Eastern Time tonight at defense.gov. And according to a new report, California is planning to compensate residents who are descendants of slaves. Each recipient could receive over $200,000 despite the state's looming budget deficit. The New York Times reported on Thursday that the California Reparations Task Force may compensate Black or African Americans who are descendants of slavery. About 6.5% of California residents, or 2.5 million people, identify as Black or African American. The task force may hand out as much as $569 billion, which would come out to about $220,000 per person. The nine-person panel will decide if the compensation would be distributed in the form of tuition and housing grants or direct cash payments. The task force would also need to decide where the money would come from. The final report should be released next year. In November, the Legislative Analyst's Office reported the state will likely have a $24 billion budget deficit next year. California tends to tax the rich more than other states, but economic downturns and people leaving the state may be the cause of decreased tax revenue. In a case involving college students' free speech, a judge recently ruled in favor of three students who sued their community college in Fresno. We heard from one of the students and an attorney on the case. NTD's David Lamb reports. On October 14th, a federal district court judge ordered Clovis Community College to abandon its speech policy that resulted in suppressing a student group's viewpoints. Staff from the community college took down students' posters that criticized authoritarianism. Alejandro Flores, founder of the Young Americans for Freedom chapter at Clovis, told NTD he was taken aback from this whole process as he wasn't expecting it at all. If it's happening here at my school, it's happening across other campuses. This area is fairly conservative. so. On November 2021, Flores, Daniel Flores, and Juliet Colunga obtained approval to post anti-communist flyers from their conservative student organization to bulletin boards inside campus buildings. It's part of the group's annual event called Freedom Week. So all we wanted to do was to put these flyers up on our college campus, to let students know, you know, under communism, this is how many people have died. The school's poster policy prohibited flyers with inappropriate or offensive language or themes. Jeff Zeman, attorney with the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, 
filed the lawsuit on August 2022 on behalf of Flores' Young American for Freedom chapter. The court's grant of the preliminary injunction was a huge win for our students. Um, and you know, we are hoping that this case will uh, ultimately vindicate their rights in their entirety. The lawsuit argues that the school's policy discriminates against the students' viewpoints in a public forum and that it's unconstitutional under the First Amendment for banning speech that the government deems offensive. Anthony Di Maria, attorney representing the college district, told NCD that the district and Clovis Community College values the First Amendment rights of all students and staff. To that end, the flyer policy in question has already been replaced and all campus clubs are able to post their materials without any of the prior concerns raised. I want people to hash out their ideas, their beliefs, and to exchange and, you know, to have a conversation because that's the only way you can actually grow as a person you can grow, and you can figure out which ideology is better. It's by actually communicating. The judge ruled that the school's previous policy, quote, undermines the school's own interests in fostering a diversity of viewpoints on campus, thus frustrating rather than promoting the college's basic educational mission. Now, the case is still ongoing, but prosecution is seeking a permanent injunction and to grant monetary damages for the students. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, what is the legacy of former Chinese Communist Party leader Jiang Zemin? We take a look at how Jiang helped the Chinese regime push its global ambitions, especially against the U.S. And at the World Cup, the U.S. plays the Netherlands Saturday morning. But will injured star Christian Pulisic be cleared to suit up? NTD's Dave Martin has the verdict. That and more coming up. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm excited to announce my original My Slippers are back in stock. Last Christmas, you made them the number one selling My Pillow product, and now I've added smaller sizes, larger sizes, wide sizes, and all new colors. And with your promo code, you still save $90 a pair. What makes My Slippers different is my exclusive four layer design that you're not going to find in any other slippers. My Slippers patented layers make them ultra comfortable, extremely durable, and they help relieve stress on your feet. Wear them anytime, anywhere. You'll absolutely love My Slippers, and I'm extending my 60 day money back guarantee until March 1st, 2023, making them the best Christmas gifts ever. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen now. Use your promo code to save $90 on my original My Slippers. That's only $49.98 a pair. Quantities won't last long, so please order now. A sharp warning to the Chinese Communist Party. Dozens of U.S. lawmakers tell the regime not to respond violently to protesters who are standing up for freedom. Protests continue around the nation and the world, calling for an end to the Chinese Communist Party. Here's NTD's Melina Wisecup with more details. In the wake of multiple anti-CCP protests breaking out here in the U.S. and around the world, there's a strong bipartisan consensus from lawmakers on Capitol Hill standing with those protesters and warning the Chinese Communist Party not to react violently. So this was this bipartisanship in this warning was displayed in a letter this week where a group of Republicans and Democrats sent a letter to the CCP ambassador writing, quote, we are following the current peaceful protests in China over your government's policies very carefully. We are also closely watching the Chinese Communist Party's reaction to them. They then point to the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre where the regime killed hundreds if not thousands of peaceful protesters and these lawmakers warned the CCP if a similar violent reaction to peaceful protests happens again they say we believe there will be grave consequences for the U.S. China relationship causing extraordinary damage to it. Now, that letter was signed by a number of Republican and Democrat senators. In addition to this, today we spoke with the chairwoman of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Here's her message along with other future members of that caucus. 
We continue to monitor the situation. We share many of the same concerns that are in Senator Merkley's letter. Um, and our, I think it's important for the United States to be clear that we're watching this very carefully and uh, we would urge our, our uh, uh, the people in the Chinese government to understand that this, this, we have had this experience before with Tiananmen Square and so let's hope that democracy continues to prevail. I think what the protest, pr protesters are doing, it sounds like it's really taking a stand for their own lives, for their own rights, for humanitarian efforts. Uh, you know, when I've talked about foreign policy, to me, the dignity of human rights is absolute priority. And all policy that we look at, we have to look at, look at it from that angle. No government, be it here at home or abroad, should ever crack down on people just trying to make their voice heard. And I know that this is going to be a group of people uh, our freshman class that is deeply dedicated to human rights. Now there was a protest here in D.C. at the Chinese embassy uh, just a couple of nights ago and there will be another protest here in Washington, D.C. this Sunday. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weisskopf, NTD News. Former Chinese Communist Party leader Jiang Zemin died earlier this week. We take a moment to look back at his legacy. How did Jiang help the Chinese regime push its global ambitions? NTD's Juliet Song has the details. A leader with blood on his hands, Jiang's prominence is tied to two of the biggest human rights abuses in China's recent history, the Tiananmen Square massacre and the persecution campaign against the country's largest spiritual group, Falun Gong. Jiang's reign also proved critical to Beijing's global ambitions. Jiang's rule laid a foundation for the Chinese Communist Party. It allowed the regime to grow to a point to be able to compete with the U.S. Hong He is a China affairs analyst. He noted Jiang's reign represented a key stage in the regime's goal, to replace the U.S. as top world superpower. He said even though Beijing still saw the U.S. as its enemy, it was not economically strong enough to compete. And Zhang's goal was covering up Beijing's true ambitions and then using Washington's help to develop China and strengthen Beijing's political power. He said Zhang's term marked the honeymoon stage of U.S.-China relations. The U.S. also had a need. The big money on Wall Street needed access to China's market, so both sides clicked. Jiang showed up ties with the U.S., visiting the country several times. America also helped China enter the World Trade Organization, which paved the way for the country's rise to a global superpower. Two decades after joining the World Trade Organization, China's GDP grew eight times, becoming the world's second largest economy. Foreign capital poured into China, and Western markets opened their doors to Chinese goods making China the world's largest goose exporter. He He noted understanding Jiang also clears up a misconception about Beijing's human rights abuses. The rights abuse didn't come out of the blue under Xi Jinping's reign. It stretches all the way back to Jiang Zemin's persecution against Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a spiritual meditation practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. Its popularity exploded in China in the 90s to the point that about one in every 13 Chinese citizens were practicing it. But in 1999, Jiang Zemin launched a nationwide persecution campaign against the practice. Millions of practitioners were thrown into jail and tortured. At least 4,000 have been killed. An unclear number had their organs harvested by force. Jiang is also tied to China's Tiananmen Square massacre. He was able to become China's leader exactly because of the massacre. That's a reward for what he did during the crackdown. In 1989, student protests erupted across China. And while China's rulers were divided on how to respond, Jiang already started clamping down on local protests in Shanghai. Later, the regime sent in tanks and opened fire on unarmed student protesters asking for democracy. The event came to be known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Before the massacre, Jiang was Shanghai's party chief. He was about to retire from the position at the time. After it, China's then leader handpicked him to rule the country. Juliet Song, NTD News. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. American soccer star Christian Pulisic 
will play Saturday in the World Cup match against the Netherlands. The U.S. Soccer Federation said Friday after the team's training session that Pulisic had been given the go-ahead. The 24-year-old winger was injured Tuesday while scoring the game-winning goal against Iran. Pulisic collided with the goalie on the play, resulting in a bruised pelvic bone. After lying in pain for several minutes, he eventually made his way into the match, but at halftime was subbed out and taken to the hospital. And in basketball news, former NBA star Jeremy Lin, who now plays professionally in China, was fined 10,000 yen which is about $1,400 for criticizing quarantine facilities. The league gave no details of what he actually said other than to say he made, quote, inappropriate remarks about quarantine hotel-related facilities where they stayed. A Shanghai news outlet called The Paper posted a video of Lin complaining about hotel workout facilities saying, quote, can you believe this is a weight room and what kind of garbage is this? The Communist Party in China has confined millions of people to their homes as part of their zero COVID strategy. Recently, this has sparked countrywide protests. Lin, now 34, played in the NBA for nine seasons, becoming the first player of Asian descent to do so. He burst on the scene in 2012 for the New York Knicks, appearing on the cover of Sports Illustrated for two straight weeks. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, 11 NBA games are in the works, including the defending champion Golden State Warriors hosting the Chicago Bulls. And for you hockey fans, the NHL has a triple header plan for tonight, featuring a pair of playoff looking teams battling in New York as the Islanders host the Nashville Predators. And that's a wrap for sports. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And the promised information about Twitter's suppression of the story of Hunter Biden's laptop is just now coming out. Musk retweeted a thread by author Matt Taibbi called The Twitter Files. Taibbi calls it, quote, a Frankensteinian tale of a human-built mechanism grown out of the control of its designer. He says it's based on thousands of internal Twitter documents. So far, it details how Twitter staff developed tools to limit certain types of activity, countering the mission of communication without barriers. According to one of the tweets, by 2020, one executive would write to another, more to review from the Biden team. The reply would be handled. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.